We'll get going. Um, thank you so much for coming to my talk this morning. My name is Nathan Cheever. I'm a data scientist, uh, actually from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, but I lived in New York about four years ago and absolutely loved it. And they said, you know, anyone can submit a proposal. So back in April, I was like, what the heck? And here we are. So, um, and I work for a company called Advanced MD. We build medical software for small to medium-sized practices. And you know, you've been staring at this kind of creepy infomercial guy for a while, so <laughs> let's get going. But my talk is going to be on how to you know, go a thousand times faster, potentially, vectorizing with pandas and NumPy. And uh, you know, it does kind of sound like an infomercial, a thousand times faster. You know? Is that kind of speed really possible with a language that isn't really known um, for high speed execution like, like uh, Python is? Um, so it really just comes down to how you approach doing your manipulation operations. One way that we're probably all familiar with is your regular um, Python, you know, your vanilla Python for loop, where the time to complete your operation is directly proportional to the number of elements you're iterating over multiplied by the time it takes to do each operation on each element. Another uh, option is vectorization where you're still going to do the same thing to your data, get the same end result, but do it in a fraction of the time. So when we're talking about a thousand times faster, that's like something that took you 15 seconds in a for loop, now you're getting done in 15 milliseconds. So there's a huge efficiency gain. Um, and of course, this depends on you know, your, things like your machine, the version of Python that you're using, pandas versions and that's the size of your data obviously so um, actual results may vary right um, so we'll we'll see that but again the main takeaway is like this is a strategy it's a strategy and you can use it and get a lot of efficiency gain and we're going to especially see that for conditional uh, vectorizations so we say this word a lot vectorization what is vectorization um, basically at its core it's just not writing Python for loops, but operating on an array or a series all at once. And if you've been doing pandas for a while, but haven't actually done, like, like I, I've been doing pandas, I know pandas, but this vectorization thing, what is that? The chances are you've been doing it already. So if you've been doing things like column arithmetic, where you have a column of ints and you add something to it, or group bys, transforms, filters, uh, pandas, two date times, string functions, things like that. That's, that's vectorization because you didn't write a for loop, right? Um, and again, at its core, when we do NumPy vectorization, what we're doing is we're passing the computation and the data down from Python land, if you will, through NumPy's API to C. And then C will operate on that data type because it's one, you know, one day, you can, in NumPy you can only have one data type in an array. You can't have mixed data types. So you do that transformation in C, which is blazingly fast, and then you get the data back in, in Python. So you don't have to learn C. The amazing people who develop NumPy have kind of solved that for you. And this allows for huge speed increases, like I've said. And so this is a topic that people are starting to talk a lot about. And so I Googled pandas NumPy vectorization, and these were, I just took some screenshots of several articles that were popping up. And by and large, you know, they all kind of have the same thesis, which is don't do for loops if you can help it, do vectorization. And if, if you're new to this talk, or if you're new to this topic, I highly recommend uh, Sophia Heisler's PyCon talk from 2017. This was my introduction to this. And there's a link there, uh, right here. Hopefully that's high enough, everyone can see it. Um, it's a fantastic talk and it was, like I said, my introduction. And what she does is she has a haversine distance function where she's calculating the distance between, I think it's a Brooklyn super, superhero comic book store. So the latitude and longitude for the superhero comic book store in Brooklyn and all of these other rows in her data frame that have you know, other latitudes and longitudes. So, uh, and she shows us like at least five different ways to approach that kind of thing. The first three, for loops, and then iterose, and uh, pandas dot apply method, those are all variants of a for loop, essentially. 
um, some are slower than others. So it gets faster as you move down that list on the left. And then when you switch into vectorization, you stop operating on individual elements row by row, and you start operating on entire series or, or um, arrays. So when I saw this, everything I was pretty much doing was dot apply. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try this out. I'm going to learn how to do vectorization. And I picked this function as my starting point. And so there's going to be a lot of code. Um, but don't worry too much about what the code is doing. Just kind of look for like the high level stuff, like what's it, you know, what's the structure of it. So here it's just a pretty basic conditional statement. If the value at this column in this row, current status is equal to the string none, return the row value for this column status at time of lead, otherwise return current status. It's, I'm like, this will be great. I'm going to vectorize this from what I've learned for her talk. So I took it. Oh, so I threw it in a dot apply, you know? And this took 8.1 seconds to run on my data set at the time. And I'm like, oh, this is great. Vectorization's got to be faster than this. So on the left is my old function. And then on the right is my new function. And the big difference is instead of passing in a row one at a time and then operating on it one at a time, row by row, I passed in my two columns to my function. And I wonder if anyone can guess what's going to happen. But uh, when I tried this out, I got this lovely error, value error. And it's like, I can't determine how to tell if this is true. How can I tell if a column is equal to a string? Is it all of the values in the column? Is it any of the values in the column? It's ambiguous. So it threw the error, and I was discouraged. I was like, maybe vectorizing if-else statements is uh, impossible, right? And so I went back and I looked through her talk, and there was nothing in there for, for if-else conditional stuff. I looked through other articles, and I'm like, seriously, there's nothing here. So hence, that's why I'm here. I'm going to tell you about how to vectorize you know, conditional things. And uh, we can overcome this together. So the answer for me eventually was numpy.where. And this is a, a lovely little function. And uh, it is the thing you would use for vectorizing an if-else statement. So here's a quick look at the syntax. Um, it's a lot like Excel's if function. Who here has worked with Excel? Don't be afraid. It's OK. <laughs> OK. No judgment here. Um, we all have to start somewhere, right? <laughs> uh, so it's very much like that, where you give it a conditional statement, something that will evaluate to true or false. And then the second argument will be, here's what I want to return if it's true. And then, again, the third would be what I want to return if it's false, if that condition evaluates to false. So here's how my vectorized basic function that we were looking at before looks now. I'm testing, do the values in this series equal this string? If so, return the second uh, argument. Otherwise, return the third argument. And that's how you would do it. You would just say numpy.where, like that, assign it to a new pandas series. Another thing you can also do, and I really like this, is it doesn't always have to be, um, you don't always have to, for your second and third arguments, you don't always have to return arrays explicitly. You can return a scalar like that. You can just say NA, like a string. And NumPy will take care of the broadcasting to fit the shape that, where that condition is true. OK. Another thing you can also do to speed things up is add dot values at the end of your series. And what that does is it exposes the underlying NumPy array, just the raw data. You lose the index and all of, like, you lose the series. You shed that, and then you get just the raw underlying data. So it has less to handle in the computation, and it can go a lot faster. So let's compare. So we have my original one on the left that I was using dot apply with, and the NumPy vectorized one on the right. Um, 8.1 seconds, which is way too long for a millennial like me, right? I just don't have the patience. And we got it down to 8.8 .8 milliseconds, which is 920 times faster. So we're almost you know, to my talk. We're almost justifying my talk, but we'll get there, I promise. 
So if, some, if you may be more familiar with this, maybe you read those articles, you would have seen this other function come up called numpy.vectorize. And you're like, hey, what about numpy.vectorize? It says vectorize, right? Like that's gotta be the thing. And the answer is kind of, because what numpy.vectorize does is it doesn't really like vectorize it. What it does is it takes in a Python function, like mine right here, just a regular you know, Python function, and it converts it into what's called a, a, a NumPy universal function, or a ufunc. That, basically that means it can now take in arrays and return arrays. So this is how you can do that. And for those of you who can't see the time, it's 137 milliseconds, right? So it's like, you could stop here and be like, great, you know, it's a little more than a tenth of a second compared to 8.1 seconds, I vectorized, awesome. But that's not good enough for me because I'm an optimizer, right? Like, I, I'm, I'm just really passionate about this, so I'm gonna, you know, go with 8.8 .8 milliseconds. So multiple conditions is where it gets kind of difficult, as you can see. So how do we handle things, you know, multiple, like elif, elif, else, right? Do we give up? Um, so this is like an example. What if you wanted to vectorize something that looked like this? I had multiple LF conditions. Again, don't worry about so much about what the Python is. It's just, say you, you know, we probably have all, we probably have all dealt with something like this. So one approach is to, so we have our original function on the top. One approach is to do nested numpy where's, one numpy where for each condition you want to test. So here's the first one, here's the second one, so on and so forth. And the else, if none of the conditions are satisfied, it's like the very last uh, false statement in your nested NumPy where's. So this is one approach, and I did this for a long time, confessions, you know, um, until I realized there's a better tool, one that's not so kind of clunky and takes up so much space, and that is NumPy select. So this is your tool for vectorizing multiple conditions, two plus conditions, NumPy select. And this is how you can write it out. And I really like how clean it is. You have a list for your conditions that you wanna test and a list for the choices that would be returned should said condition prove to be true, right? So order of operations is very important. Just like in normal Python, the order of your if, elif, right? If as soon as one of those are satisfied, then it exits. So it's the same thing. So you want to have your order reflect your logic. But that's basically it. So we're doing it in a vectorized way. Here are the conditions we want to test in the order we want to test them, the choices. And those are all scalars, right? Those are all, your choices here are all just strings. They could also be vectors. I'm sorry, they could also be like you know, series or numpy arrays. And the way you call it is you say numpy select my conditions, my choices, and that else statement is captured in an argument called default. You say this is, if nothing is met, none of these conditions are met, catch it with this default. So let's compare. So we've got our applied method with all of these conditions. Now we're gonna do it with numpy vectorized in numpy select. So this took 12.5 seconds. This one took 140 milliseconds, which is 89 times faster. It seemed like it should be a lot faster to me. I don't know why, but that's what it is. Okay, so what about nested? Nested multiple conditions. This, to me, first time I saw, I'm like, okay, all right, that was fun, but I'm not gonna bother with this. But, but no, uh, NumPy Select still has your back, so don't fear. The way you would do it is you would chain together the conditions you would need to satisfy in order to reach the return, if that makes sense. So that first line condition there is equivalent to doing two checks, right? If inactive is equal to no and providers are equal to zero, return active no providers. So you just chain it together there using an ampersand. And then it's just numpy select. So you get that nice clean syntax and the performance gain. So again, to compare an apply with n multiple uh, nested conditions to uh, vectorized with NumPy select, we see this one takes 9.4 seconds, 24.8 milliseconds, 
380 times faster. Okay, so we still haven't reached my talk title yet, um, but we'll try, right? But what about more complicated things? Sometimes the benefit of having a function that you can run dot apply with is that you can do, you know, if a condition is met, do something with dates or like a regular expression search or something like that. Maybe you have to, heaven forbid, reference the row above you, you know, like do some kind of comparisons there. So uh, we're going to look at some of these other things that you may or may not run into. Of course, this is just a small sampling, but I just wanna show you that you can do a lot inside this framework of vectorization. Okay, so let's first consider strings. Um, this is a function that just does two regular expression searches using the package re, and we apply it down our data frame. And we're just trying to determine, is this lead paid or non-paid based on a column called lead source. So one way to vectorize this is to use pandas str, or str string uh, methods. And they, are, they come with every series that is of an object type. So every series that is an object type has a dot str method available to it. And doing dot contains is essentially the same thing as doing re dot search. So it's gonna search the entire string for your pattern. And since we're doing two checks, I put it into a numpy select. And let's compare. So I actually have one here in the middle and I'll explain that one in just a second. So our apply method took about a half of a second. Our str methods took longer. And this to me was like, oh crap, <laughs> can I still give this talk? But yes, um, this is vectorized, but vectorized doesn't always mean it's gonna be a lot faster. Vectorized just means you didn't have to loop. But now we put the burden of figuring out all of those patterns on that, that NumPy array of strings at the same time and so it took longer to do. And it kind of gets worse. Like the, maybe the more you have to search and the longer your data, it takes more time, I've found. So I thought, well, what if we use our old buddy numpy.vectorize on this function up here? And that took less time than the .str, but still longer than just looping. So I guess the takeaway is if you can, still, I would still recommend using .str just to be like pandas idiomatic and, and to use that API. But if you're seeing a de uh, performance decrease and you really just need to get through this as fast as you can, um, sometimes looping is the best, believe it or not. But this is the only time I've seen that when working with strings. So what if you have to, now we're gonna shift gears and look at dictionaries. So what if you have to conditionally look up something from a dictionary? How would you do this in your vectorized approach? Here is where I'm uh, looking up a row, uh, the, the value in a row as the key in a dictionary to get the value and then pass out the value. Nothing earth shattering about my Python here, just kind of basic dictionary lookup there and then we return what we find. So pandas has a dot map method that you can use, so you say, my series is, are going to act as the keys, and then I map it to a dictionary, and when it'll look up the key value and return, it will look up the key and return the value out. So what we're doing here is we're calling a function inside of numpy.where, and this is totally allowed. You can do this, and it will map back correctly to the right shape. So this is kind of cool. We have a scalar, a string up market that we're returning where it's true and then we're calling a function where it's false. And just to compare the times between the two, 7.84 seconds, 26.6 milliseconds. Doing the same logic, same work is being done, but 290 times faster, not bad. Okay, so what about dates? This function is just trying to determine what's the time or what's the time to complete or the weeks to complete, excuse me. So what it's doing is it's taking the difference between two dates in days and dividing it by seven to figure out like how many weeks has it been. And you can do this with 
dot days divided by seven. So this assumes already that your, your um, date series are pre-formatted to be pandas date time, right? If they were just strings with slashes and am and pm, this wouldn't work. So just as a side note there. So this is one way to do it. This is the pandas vectorized version of doing it. So one way to, uh, one way to vectorize this is to use pandas series dot dt accessor for accessing and working with date time objects in a vectorized way. So the only difference really, besides putting it into a numpy.where format, the only difference is dot dt in front of the dot days. And it's going to do the same thing with numpy.where. So that was, that was minimal, minimal surgery. Another way is to use um, typecasting. And this is more verbose, but these, are, these red lines are basically the same thing. We're casting it to a time delta and then converting it into, dividing it by a time delta of one day to get it into just the integer number of days and divide that by seven. But this, it's like the same thing. Get the days, divide it by seven. Okay, so let's compare the times. To do this kind of a date operation took me 20.5 seconds on my data set. DT took 24 milliseconds, and the NumPy typecasting took me 12.8. That is 1,601 times faster. Whew. So if you were going to throw tomatoes at me for not getting 1,000 times faster, I'm sorry. But we did it. But wait, there's more, of course. What if you have something where this is a project I had. I was given an Excel spreadsheet that they wanted me to turn into a pipeline. And a key piece of the logic was up here in Excel where they said, OK, if the ID is equal to the ID above it, which is A1 and A2, and if the difference between L2 and L1, those are dates, is less than 5, you know, return 0, otherwise return 1. So I was like, crap, how am I going to vectorize when I have to look above each time? So here's one way of solving this problem where you're using df.iter rows, on an, and on every iteration, you look above you and say, hey, is the ID equal to the uh, I minus 1 ID above me? And then is the date difference a day is greater than 5? That should have been less than 5, but well. That's, that's how I did it. But this, this took a very long time, as you might guess. So the strategy to overcome this, I used pd.shift. So I could take my column, I'm sorry, I could take my pandas series and shift it down. So now the previous value and the value I want to compare are all on the same level. And I created those as just variables, previous ID and previous date. And then I used numpy.select to handle all of the other stuff. I just said, is the, uh, are the internal ID values equal to previous ID? And does the date created minus previous date be less than 5? So just using this, I was able to get a huge speed up. So this took 3 minutes and 17 seconds, which is just really bad. Um, this took 17.9 milliseconds and you know, did the same work, just using pandas shift and numpy select. So this was a whopping 11,006 <laughs> times faster. That's how I felt, you know. <laughs> so what about more complicated -er things? You know, you might be thinking this is good, but my stuff is still too, too intense, too beefy. Uh, it's just too much to vectorize, and that's OK. There are, you know, there are always lots of things you could do. But if you want to do, I'm trying to keep this in the frame of minimal amount of refactoring for you and not having to learn another language or framework, still staying within the same pandas and numpy API. Of course, you know, there's Cython and all you know, other things. But that's kind of what I'm trying to do for you. So um, one option that I've used is a parallel apply. If you want to apply your, your stuff just row by row, one thing you can do is parallel, parallelize it um, using multiprocessing. So if you have a four core, four cores, four CPUs, you can use this function on the left to parallelize your apply 
to each core of your machine. And so say if you had um, 1,000 rows, it would chop it up into 250, uh, or not into 250 pieces, but chunks of four. So 250 over here, 250 over here, 250 over here, and 250 over here. Map that function, run it, and then bring it back into one data frame. And so this has been helpful also. Another option is Dask. Dask is, provides an API that is just slightly different than Pandas and NumPy and can do kind of the same stuff even on a single machine, but also gives you the ability to scale out to terabytes on clusters. So that's another thing you might want to look into as well. So um, just about out of time, but just a quick takeaway is, you know, actual results may vary, right? Just, but in general, this is a strategy you can use that can speed up your operations immensely. Um, if you have one condition you want to vectorize, numpy.where, that's your thing. If it's two plus, numpy select. Um, and if your logic is too beefy, too much for vectorization, there are, there are other alternatives you can use without major refactoring. And of course, just before you're optimizing, be sure you know that you're, what you're doing. <laughs> like, don't optimize something that's wrong. Just make sure you have really nailed your logic. All right, so thank you so much. Um, this is a link to the repo, and uh, there are also links to the slides in there as well. There's a data set, and you, know, you can play around with it if you want. And that's my email if you have questions and Twitter handle and stuff. So I hope this, hope this gave you something you can then take and start using. So thanks a lot.